What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. So yesterday, in probably the second most anticipated game of uh, Christmas, the Philadelphia 76ers played the Milwaukee Bucks. And these two teams are considered the two best teams in the Eastern Conference. I know there's Boston, but you know I'm not sold on Boston um, making it to the NBA Finals. I think it's going to be one of these two teams. If you Ask me my opinion. I think it'll be the Bucks, uh, but yesterday Philadelphia stepped up to the challenge, man. I know they felt the pressure. Uh, Joel Embiid has been criticized uh, lately for his lack of aggression this season, um, uh, most notably by Shaq and Charles Barkley. They question uh, his intensity. Uh, he's been kind of passive compared to last season. Last year, I think he averaged something like closer to 28 and 12. I think this year, before the criticisms, he was more like 22 and 11, which is still good numbers, but not superstar level, levels that we're accustomed to seeing from Joel Embiid. Uh, and he's been dialing it up lately. And the Sixers came out blitzkrieg. I mean, like an old fashioned. Like Nazi blitzkrieg, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about World War II terms. Uh, just bombing away, you know. And it's actually, if you're a Milwaukee Bucks fan, you're kind of at least happy that your team, which at one point in time was down by nearly 30 points, was able to at least battle back. And if they could have made a couple of stops at the end, you know what I'm saying? If they could have stopped a couple of those, those last Minute three, they could have maybe made a game of it, but the final score was 121 to 109. And um, it was a statement game by Philly. You know what I'm saying? Um, Philadelphia has been somewhat disappointing this year. You know what I'm saying? Most people considered that they would be battling with Milwaukee for the best record in the Eastern Conference. Um, they're still good. And uh, they now have a record of twenty three and ten. The Bucks now are twenty seven and five. So the Bucks still have the best record in the NBA. But <clears throat> there's one thing that if you're a Milwaukee Bucks fan, you have to be concerned about. Well, there's more than one thing, but uh, you know. Uh, but Giannis, though, you do have to worry about the long term load that Giannis is carrying for this team. Um, Giannis has been bugged by a nagging injury as of late. Not serious injury, not a serious injury. I think it's like a, a, a thigh contusion or something like that. And it has been affecting his, his play a little bit lately. Um, and it really affected him yesterday. And Joel Embiid's defense and the Sixers' defense. You can't take that away either. Um... But I think Giannis was only 9 of 27 from the floor yesterday. And that's the most missed shots, I believe, that Giannis has ever had in, a, in an NBA game in his career. Uh, Giannis, right, you know, only, like I said, made 9 out of 27 shots. And um, he wasn't his normal self. Uh, he did have 14 points and 7 rebounds. 18 points, but only but on 27 shots. That's not gonna. That's not the formula for uh, a winning uh, Bucks team. Now, Chris Middleton did have 31 points, eight rebounds, four assists, but <clears throat> they weren't what you would call impactful points. Like you saw the final score, and you're like, "Wow, okay, Middleton had 31, but it came in garbage time. It came." When the game was already decided, I don't know. Brook Lopez had 11 points and five rebounds. It's like Brook Lopez has forgotten how to shoot threes now, for the most part. Um, DiVincenzo, I think is his name. He, he, I like him. Leslie Matthews was not a factor. George Hill was brilliant as he normally is. Kyle, Kuz, uh, Kyle Corver really didn't do much. Ilya Silver didn't do too much. Sterling Brown didn't do too much. Robin Lopez and Pat Connaughton didn't do much at all. But the Sixers were the story. Uh, they made a, I think, I think it was a franchise record, 21 three-pointers. Tobias Harris had 22 points. Al Holford had 11 points. Joel Embiid, 31 points, 11 rebounds. 
If the game had been closer, I think Joel B would have went for 40 plus. Ben Simmons, 15 points, 7 rebounds, 14 assists. Uh, Richardson had 18 points. Uh, Scott only three points, but the damage was done. And, and Cork, what is it? Corkmas, Corkmas, sixteen points. I think he hit like four three pointers or something like that. Five, four or five three pointers. So, look, not going to win games giving up that many threes. Twenty one of forty four from three point range. Wasn't that the Bucks were terrible? It's just that the Sixers had a franchise record performance from. The line. Also, they kept Giannis off of the foul line. And that was questionable, you know what I'm saying, in my opinion. Uh, the Sixers won the rebounding contest 49-47. Assists 29-23. Blocks 7-6. Steals 9-6. The Bucks had more turnovers. Now, the Bucks dominated points in the paint, but when you offset that by hitting 21 three-pointers, which is 62 points from the three-point line, um, that kind of offsets that, you know. Look, it has to be said, man. Um, Chris Middleton, look, you know, it's not his fault that Milwaukee chose to give him $35 million. You know what I'm saying? Uh, hats off to him, you know. They, 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 you know, they gave it to him. But when you make that much money, you're expected to be, you know, max money. You're expected to be a player who plays consistently at an all-star level. And when I look at these guys make this this type of money, right, it, it reminds me of Scottie Pippen. Scottie Pippen was criminally underpaid throughout his tenure with the Chicago Bulls. Throughout his tenure with the team, he was criminally underpaid. Um, Michael Jordan, except for the last two years that he was with the Bulls was criminally underpaid as well. So, but I want to focus on Pippen though because Pippen was a legitimate number two guy. Um, I think for any team, any player, and any team that aspires to win a championship, you got to have a legitimate number two guy, another guy that can get his own shot, another guy that can step up and uh, fill in the gaps when the other guy. It's not getting it going. There were many, many games when the Chicago Bulls uh, were going through, you know, uh, crucial, critical regular season games, which are psychologically important. I know people tend to say regular season games don't matter. Only the, co the, the collection of them matter. But when you're going up against a conference opponent or uh, Eastern Conference opponent or a nemesis, those games do matter. You know what I'm saying? They do matter. And I remember there were some games where the Bulls were playing against the Miami Heat or the Knicks. And there, there were some games, some of those games Jordan might not brought his A game. And other guys had to step up. Earlier on, it might have been, uh, you know, maybe uh, Craig Hodges and, 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 you know, and those guys, John Paxson, uh, Horace Grant might step up offensively. Scotty might step up in the second three-peat team. Uh, it might be Tony Kukoc stepping up. It might be Pippen, or it might be a collection of the guys from the bench. Ron Harper might hit some critical shots. You know, shit, I've even seen Dennis Rodman, of all people, in some critical games, uh, make some critical jumpers. I remember it was, uh, it might have been Utah or Miami. One of those two teams, I think it was Miami, it was one game where Dennis Rodman was actually hitting jumpers and fadeaways. You know, that wasn't normally what he would make, but he just was in a rhythm. And he was actually making fallaway jumpers. And, and, and you know, and, you know, I, I don't know. But anyway, the point is, you got to have somebody that can step up, man. And whatever... You going up against a team that's up in, in quality like the Sixers or whoever, you're going to have to have, unless you're just beating the shit out of them collectively, if they're focusing on Giannis and Giannis is being slowed down, then they're going to need someone else who consistently can step up and create his own shot and fill in for 
uh, the other guy. And I just don't see that with Chris Middleton, man. When I see Chris Middleton, I just see a third option guy. You know what I'm saying? I see a guy who is capable, but he's not a third option. He's not a second option. Um, when I think, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you who I I kind of compare Chris Middleton to to an extent. Although the other guy was more athletic, and you know, Chris Middleton to me is like Byron Scott with the Lakers. You see what I'm saying? He's Byron Scott. He's a he's a great third or fourth option, but he's not a second get secondary guy. You know what I'm saying? Earlier on, if the first scoring option was Kareem and then Magic, all right, then you might have uh, Scott. Well, really, to be honest with you, Scott was the fourth option because even if it was Magic and then Kareem, then you had big game James. You see what I'm saying? Milton is more like Byron Scott, an all-star level guy, but – He's not going to do it. And that's why I think that Milwaukee really needs to consider trading for that second guy. Now, look, now I want to get I want to I want to make this perfectly clear. Don't come my video and saying, oh, you're backtracking. Oh, you didn't. No, I'm not. All I've been advocating is for people to give Milwaukee their respect as a championship contending team. Take them serious. They are good enough to make it to the NBA finals. I've said that time and time again. I've never been, however, adamant that they will win a championship. I think they could, but everything will have to go in their favor. Giannis will have to have a monster series. Everybody's going to have to be on fire. Uh, and honestly, their opponent may have to be beset with injuries. You know what I'm saying? That happens sometimes. I mean, it could happen. But if you're talking about a uh, fair matchup all the way, I kind of don't favor Milwaukee to win the title. And they definitely would have to have home court advantage to even have a shot with the team they have right now. But I just don't – I think they need someone else. I think they need somebody – I'm just going to throw a name out there. You know what I'm saying? I know people going to be like, it's crazy, too raw, you demented bastard. What are you talking about? I think maybe a guy – like Russell Westbrook might help this team. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know Russell is Russ. I know the reputation he has. But I think that this team would be one of the better fits for him. First of all, he would have a strong coach in Mike Budenholzer who wouldn't allow him to, to, to get away with some of the bad shit he's been doing the last couple of years. And we actually have a coach that will coach him. And... Ring him in when he's starting to do, you know, when he's when he's turning into Westbrook, you know what I'm saying? Um, but Russell Westbrook, when he makes smarter shots and he plays within the team concept, all right, he still is a very very good player. Um, the, my problem with Russell Westbrook is if he would just Stop shooting three-pointers. The thing about it, when you look at his two-point percentage, right, it's still remarkably high. The last three years, he's shot 48, 49, and this year 49% from two-point range. So he's still an efficient guy when he's scoring, when he's scoring from 22 feet inward. It's just the fact he keeps insisting on shooting threes. Even last night. He went, what, 13 for 32, I think it was. But if you take the three-pointers away, he's 13 of 23, which is efficient. I think that's about 54% or so, 56%. He just has to stop shooting that goddamn shot. Only shoot it when you're wide open and you get a good look. Uh, you know, I noticed Russell's free throw woes have corrected themselves. A couple of years ago, the NBA instituted a rule where you, you can't have these long extended free throw routines anymore. They want to speed the game up, want to speed everything up, speed delivery. You know, Mr. Rogers, speed delivery. 
So he wasn't able to do his routine, and as a result, his free throw percentage suffered, dropping from consistently in the 80s down to 72%, and then last year all the way down to 65%, I think it was. But this year, after some early struggles, he's up to 79, close to 80% now, which is where he normally is. But, you know, Russell Westbrook with this team, especially if they could push the tempo, because Russell excels in, uh, you know, in the fast, you know, he, he excels when a team is playing more full court, fast break situations. That's when Russell Westbrook is at his best because he's more unpredictable uh, as far as the defense is concerned in that situation and more unstoppable. It's the half court where he sometimes struggles. Um, he sometimes struggles in that situation. Um, but if Russell Westbrook could also actually focus more on playing defense instead of just roaming the passing lanes and, and whatnot and, and still, you know, trying to pad his numbers with rebounding and actually fucking play deep. But you know what? Mike Budenholzer, would, would, I think, would cut that shit out. You know, the last couple of years, guys like James Harden and Russell Westbrook, one of the problems is that they've been on teams where they're not really being coached. Right now with Mike D'Antoni, who's probably the worst coach in the NBA, and then with Billy Donovan, who I don't know why the fuck he still has a job. Uh, but Mike Budenholz, you have a real coach there. Um, and also historically, when you think about it, every great big man who has won multiple ch uh, championships, for the most part, they've had a superstar or all-star level, excuse me, okay, have had a superstar or all-star level uh, backcourt mate. You know what I'm saying? All the way back to the days with, you know what I'm saying, like George Mikan and Slater Martin. Then, of course, you have Bill Russell, uh, Bob Cousy, you know what I'm saying? Um, who else? Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Oscar Robertson. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with, the, you know, the Lakers with that. And uh, Magic Johnson. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's always been a situation where if you have a great championship level big man, there's always some bad guy in the, in the backcourt that is, is a yin and a yang. You know what I'm saying? Shaq and Kobe, even though they had, had their issues, you know what I'm saying? But Shaq and Kobe, um, trying to think of anybody else. Um, No, I mean, there, there's been other, you know, other instances, you know, Tim Duncan, earlier on it was David Robinson, but, you know, but later on, of course, it was Manu Ginobili and uh, Tony Parker. So you get my point where there's always, when you have a great big man, you need a complimentary, a complimentary uh, backcourt uh, dominant player. And I don't think Chris Milton is that guy. And even if you don't agree with, if it's Russell Westbrook, Maybe you can think of somebody else. I mean, maybe you can think of Chris Paul. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just don't trust Chris Paul's health at this point. You know what I'm saying? He's playing magnificently so far this year. He's shooting 47% from the floor, 38% from three, nearly 90% from the foul line. I think he's averaging like 16 points, uh, uh, almost seven assists in limited minutes. He's playing great, and he has the Thunder, who some people thought could be a lottery team, actually in the playoffs right now, I think, in the Western Conference. Now, all of this is nice talk and all, right? All this is nice talk. I think Max Kellerman uh, brought up Drew Holiday or something. I don't know about him. Uh, but all this is nice talk. But first of all, if you're the Bucks, who you give up? And <laughs> who's going to take that contract? You know, this isn't a video game. You know, the numbers have to work out. So, I mean, if I'm Milwaukee, I would be willing to give up Eric Bledsoe and Chris Middleton for Russell Westbrook. I would, I mean, I know that's a risk, you know what I'm saying? And if you give up Chris Middleton, then you're taking out your third guy. But, look, I think you have to make some moves. And the reason why I think you have to if you're the Milwaukee Bucks is 
Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Let's say the Milwaukee Bucks lose to the Philadelphia 76ers in the Eastern Conference Finals, right? And then there's even more pressure now, more criticism on Giannis from the media, whether it's fair or not, that he's not getting to the next level. And then, you know what I'm saying, if you're Giannis, you're starting to feel that pressure. Then you're starting to wonder, you know, maybe Milwaukee is the city to win a championship. And then you're starting to look at all these other teams. You know, maybe you need to get out of that smaller market and go to a bigger market. You know what I'm saying? Because that pressure is going to get there to win. So if you're Milwaukee, you're going to have to do something eventually to appease, to, to just make it seem like you're trying to do something. Um, but I think you got to do something because I just don't think Chris Milton is the answer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, as, as a number two guy. He's a number three guy. He's a third option to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, and also, I by, by extension, I'm also saying that I don't think Eric Bledsoe is the guy at point guard that's going to lead this team to a championship. I don't trust him. I mean, I know he's playing pretty good this year, I guess. But I just don't trust him. I saw him in the playoffs last year, and for the most part, he struggled. And there's nothing to make me think that he's not going to struggle again. And last year, you know, the Bucks had Malcolm Brogdon, who I love as basically a point guard. You know what I'm saying? You don't have him now. So, I don't know, man. Tell me what you guys think.